Hello, and welcome to our concert. Uh, today's concert is entitled Dance Party. We're going to be playing for you two suites of dances from the height of the French Baroque era. Um, just a little bit of introduction. Um, for those of you that were able to attend, uh, uh, Judith Karp, or Schwartz Karp gave a wonderful, wonderful pre-concert talk about the dancing, kind of the importance, and then the different steps that made up the dancing in the French Baroque. Um, and we have it, we have a recording of it. If you missed it and want to see it still, please contact us and we can send you a copy. Um, but uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of an introduction. Um, the reign of Louis XIV was very important historically and also uh, musically and in especially the world of dance. Uh, Louis himself was an avid dancer. He loved it. Uh, he danced all the way from childhood all the way up into his uh, 60s and 70s. He had uh, dance masters uh, teaching him and working with him to choreograph wonderful dances. Um, and his court kind of created the idea of dance as being you know, a sophisticated courtly thing, kind of the ancestor of modern ballet, um, but it was also, you know, kind of directly what ballet was in the 17th and early 18th century. Um, and his dance masters took uh, the folk dances from all over Europe and kind of made them elegant and fancy and sophisticated and turned them into what you know, what became French court dance. And um, the nobles, uh, when, when Louis moved the court to Versailles, uh, he moved all of the nobility in there with him and uh, kept them all busy with dancing lessons. First of all, uh, he, you know, since he himself loved dance so much, he loved watching it and he loved having the other nobility participate in it. And, um, you know, there was kind of a little bit of competition between the, the various uh, members of the court as to, you know, who could dance the best and, you know, who, who had the best, the, you know, the most pleasing calves and ankles and, you know, the, the best trained dancers. And, you know, he kept all of the, all of the courtiers uh, busy training with dance masters to be able to dance elegantly for the king as a matter of status and as a matter of position. Uh, this also, you know, kept them busy so they wouldn't be off conspiring against him uh, the way that they often did against some of his predecessors in the French throne. Um, one of the most central figures was Jean-Baptiste Lully, uh, who started out being a dancer himself, uh, and uh, he worked with a young Louis XIV before he actually took the throne. And then um, upon Louis's ascension to his reign, um, Lully himself became kind of the master of music and all things music in, in France and Paris. Uh, he was the head of the opera. He actually wrote and conducted um, all of the operas in Paris. Um, he conducted the, um, the king's smaller ensembles, and uh, he ran a lot of the dances. Uh, he was a very central figure in the music of uh, Paris and Versailles at that time. Um, up until 1687, when I'm sure I've related the story of his famous conducting accident, um, when a as a conductor, he accidentally, um, he had a big staff that he was using to conduct. You know, they didn't have little batons. They had a big staff that they would wave around to indicate the time. And he accidentally stomped it on his big toe um, and uh, got gangrene. And of course, since he was a dancer, he, they could not amputate his big toe. But unfortunately, that cost him his life. Um, afterwards, um, all of the music in France were kind, was kind of written and performed in his style, kind of in his memory, as in like, you know, the ghost of Louis just continued to dominate French music for the next generation, um, including uh, the prevalence of all of these court dances. You know, they were all taken from little folk dances in Europe, and I can go through them a little bit. Um, in a second, but, uh, you know, turned into these great works of art. 
and then the composers would write dance suites, uh, which were a collection of uh, several different dances. Um, you know, usually they'd start with a prelude, which is just, you know, a, a free opening, you know, to kind of get everybody attuned to the music and to the key. And then they would start introducing the dance movements. And uh, there are several different dances. Um, the first suite we will be playing today is by the composer Jacques Morel. Um, Morel still exists as kind of an anomaly um, in musicology because uh, he hasn't been actively researched yet. Um, so nobody really knows that much about his life. We know that he was a viola da gamba player who was active in Paris um, in the early part of the 18th century um, from somewhere around 1700 until at least the late 1730s. Um, very few of his compositions survive, the most famous of which being uh, his collection of pieces for viol, uh, pieces for viola da gamba, which I will be playing the first one of uh, with Sylvia today. Uh, Sylvia will be playing Continuo for me on viol, her second public appearance on viol, which is fantastic. Um, uh, Morel was a student of Moran Murray, the great viola da gamba player uh, who was at the center of uh, French music in the court. He was uh, one of Lully's closest friends and he was Lully's viola da gamba player. Um, Morel himself did not have a court appointment, but uh, he continued to be active uh, writing music um, at least through the 1730s. The other publications that he have that survives are a couple of books of um, French cantatas and uh, some things that may or may not be him or a member of his family that are organ pieces. But uh, hopefully someday in the, in the near future, somebody will finish their research and find out exactly um, all the information about Jacques Morel. Anyway, this is his first suite in A minor. It starts with a prelude. Uh, this is written in a French overture form which was something invented by Lully, uh, where there is a, a relatively short section at the beginning in a slow tempo with uh, lots of dotted rhythms, kind of serious, almost like militaristic feel. And then it uh, evolves into a very fast, sprightly uh, section uh, in this one called Beat, as in lively, um, that finishes the piece in very, you know, flourishy, virtuosic, virtuosic writing. Um, anyway, this suite has an allemand, which is a fairly slow, stately German dance. Uh, Courant, um, who Judy talked about a lot, uh, Courant was originally a fairly fast Italian running dance. In France, it was a, uh, it was a set dance in uh, triple meter with changing rhythms. Um, you can learn all about this in the talk. Sarbonne, which is a very haughty, grand, a uh, little bit slower dance. Um, this particular one is called l'agréable, as in the pleasing. Um, then there's also a gigue, which started out being a, a British Isles dance, fast, fun dance. Then there is a little bit of a character piece called la bretonne, uh, which is either a person or a dance from uh, Breton. And then it ends with a minuet. Anyway, here, without further ado, here is the suite number one in A minor by Jacques Morel.
very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to be now playing uh, the third suite by Jean Ferry Rebel. Uh, Rebel was also very active in the court of Louis XIV uh, as a violinist. As a young violinist, uh, he studied with some of the great Italian violinists um, and then uh, became part of uh, Lully's orchestra and uh, kind of became one of Lully's protégés. And uh, over time, he rose up to be the concertmaster of the orchestra, the concertmaster of the opera. Um, he wrote a few operas himself. Uh, he conducted it for a little while. Um, and he became, uh, towards the end of Louis XIV's life, he became, Rebel actually became Louis's court composer. And then later he directed the Concert Spirituel under Louis XV, uh, which was a, a set of religious themed uh, concerts uh, during Lent when the opera was shut down. Uh, Rebel was very wide, uh, very highly thought of, and he wrote a large number of pieces. Uh, most of his first pieces were actually written for violin in continuo or for two violins in continuo. Um, this actually comes from his first published collection, uh, which is a set of dance suites for violin and continuo. Um, his second published collection started the trend of um, French composers writing sonatas in imitation of the Italian style. And uh, not only Rebel's later collections, but pretty much all later collections of violin music uh, were written as these sonatas. And so these few uh, Rebel dance suites are almost the only dance suites written for violin. There are just a few others. Um, and so we're lucky to have found them and be playing them. Uh, and these, these were also published, um, I, I don't think I mentioned, the Morel was published in 1707. Uh, these were published in 1703. So right in the kind of middle towards the end of Louis XIV's reign. And again, uh, this one starts with a prelude. Uh, this particular one is fairly short and it's just kind of a single musical idea. Um, it also has an allemand, a courant, a sarabande, a gigue, a gavotte, a minuet, a rondeau, which is a piece with a repeating main theme after each section, which um, is very often, and in this case also, written in the form of, of a gavotte. And then it ends with a very cool character piece called Le Cloche, the bells, um, which imitates the sounds of uh, bells ringing in a church belfry, uh, summoning people to service. Anyway, here is the third suite in D major by Jean Ferry Rebel.
much. That is our concert. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. <laughs> Indeed. That's a good question, Mario. <laughs> You'd like to listen to a girl. I think that's so cool. Yeah. Having a vote of confidence from a cat, that is high praise. Right. I'm not seeing any other questions coming in, so thank you all so much for being here. Um, if you have other questions, if we don't catch you because of the delay um, from the stream and you have a question, please feel free to email us. You can find us directly. I'm going to throw our um, email in here. And you can also find us through our website, Influx. OK. There we go. All righty. And uh, for our Patreon folks, we will see you in the post-concert Zoom. If you are not yet a patron and you would like to join us, we would love to have you there. Um, folks who uh, donate $10 or more a month are warmly invited to our post-concert little online reception. And a, a huge thanks again to you all for being here. We will see you again soon. Take care.